Like most Americans, the more than 24,000 service members lucky enough to have been stationed in Hawaii at the start of 1941 were hopeful that two oceans would keep them out of the wars spreading across Europe and Asia. After all, life was relatively good in America at the start of the 40s after nearly a full recovery from the Great Depression of the 30s. The 40-hour workweek had just been adopted, unemployment was less than 5%. New home ownership, the highest that had ever been. Gas was at 15 cents a gallon, and nylon stockings were the new rage. Franklin Roosevelt was elected for an unprecedented third term. The majority of the country generally considered themselves to be isolationists. Few were anxious to get involved in another great war over in Europe or anywhere for that matter. In 1941, Oahu was full of life. Pearl Harbor was alive with military personnel, palm trees, and trade winds. Aloha spirit filled the air. Waikiki Beach was idyllic. The night of December 6, 1941 was a perfect Hawaiian Saturday night. There were pre-Christmas parties. Families enjoyed typical weekend activities. It was a genteel life. The next morning, the entire world would change. On December 7, 1941, at 0600, Imperial Japan launches a daring strike. Six Japanese aircraft carriers launch 181 torpedo bombers dive bombers, level bombers, and fighters. They arrive over Oahu just before 0800 and attack U.S. Pacific Fleet ships anchored at Pearl Harbor, as well as Navy air bases at Fort Island and Kaneohe Bay, the Marine Airfield at Eva, and the Army Air Corps fields at Bellows, Wheeler, and Hickam. Around 0900, a second wave of 170 Japanese aircraft attacks. 21 ships are sunk or damaged, including USS Arizona, and seven additional battleships. 188 US aircraft are destroyed, and 159 are damaged. The American casualty list includes 2,335 servicemen and 68 civilians killed. 1,178 wounded. Many sailors, soldiers, airmen, marines, and coast guardsmen fought bravely that day. Sailors like Chief Petty Officer John William Finn and Petty Officer Second Class Dory Miller, who stood on deck, grabbed a hold of machine guns, and fired at enemy aircraft from exposed positions. Soldiers like Staff Sergeant Lowell Klatz and Lieutenant Stephen Saltzman, who left the Hickam command post, exposed themselves to heavy enemy fire and shot down a Japanese Zero with only their automatic rifles. Air Corps pilots like George Welsh and Kenneth Taylor, the first American pilots to get airborne to attack the incoming Japanese bombers. And Phil Rasmussen, who took off from Wheeler Airfield in a P-36, wearing only his purple pajamas to dogfight the Japanese fighters. Marines like Lieutenant Colonel Alan Shapley, a USS Arizona Marine, who with no thought for his own safety, dove into the water, braving the hazards of continuous enemy strafing and bombing to save the life of a helpless shipmate. And Coast Guardsmen like Howard Lester Hayes, who alongside his fellow Coast Guardsmen manned anti-aircraft guns on the US Coast Guard Cutter Taney to return fire and help protect the island. Amongst the many tales of bravery that morning were also many civilians, like Cornelia Clark Fort, an instructor pilot, and would eventually become the second member of the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, and the first female pilot in American history to die on active duty in 1943. The attack on Oahu awoke the American fighting spirit and precipitated the U.S. entry into a three-year, eight-month global war, ultimately ending with the Japanese defeat and the end of World War II.
The 75th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor and Oahu is an opportunity for us to honor the courage, service, and sacrifice of the U.S. personnel present during the attacks. We remain indebted to these and all World War II Pacific Theater veterans whose service paved the way for a stable post-World War II international order in the region. The 75th commemoration of the attack is a tribute to the courage, service, and sacrifice of our greatest generation. The few remaining survivors represent the resilience and resolve of a generation that endured incredible sacrifices, changing America forever. Since the end of the war, Japan has concentrated earnestly on building a nation that values freedom, democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. Although the modern foundations of the U.S.-Japan relationship are rooted in the outcome of World War II, the relationship between our two nations has since developed into a close, fruitful alliance. Today, the relationship between our two nations has been a cornerstone of the Indo-Asia-Pacific region. For more than 50 years, the U.S.-Japan alliance has been a foundation of peace and security in Northeast Asia. Today, what defines the U.S.-Japan relationship is the deep-rooted trust, friendship, support, and cooperation between our two countries. The U.S.-Japan alliance is stronger than ever, and we look forward to continued cooperation with Japan across a broad range of regional and global issues. Understanding the devastating truths of war inspires respect the necessity to find peaceful solutions to conflict. The example set by veterans of the Pearl Harbor and Oahu attacks is an inspiration to today's military personnel. Tomorrow's military personnel and military leaders can look to them as they set their course for service with honor and distinction. The United States military is dedicated to maintaining the technological edge to ensure we are never surprised by an adversary again. Today, we are prepared for the worst case scenario to prevent attacks like the one that happened here on Oahu. We pay homage to the greatest generation's service and sacrifice because their legacy and courage must never be forgotten. <laughs>